to your first question. I decided to become a Viking. That's why I'm here. Um, all right, we're going to try to synthesize down Eastern Europe, centering on the Cold War, my entire career in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay? So, maybe a little superficial at times. But this region that runs from here down to here, 200 years ago, there were no countries. They were all part of four empires the Russian Empire. At that time, the Prussian Empire, which became the German Empire later, or at least the core of the German Empire. The Austrian Empire, or Habsburg Empire, later the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I love when empires change their names all the time, just to confuse you. And then the Turkish Empire, or the Ottoman Empire. The four empires controlled the entire region. But then in the 1800s, Something happened. Something happened that in this region was unleashed the most powerful force in the universe. That's called nationalism. Nationalism makes a nuclear device look like a firecracker. Because once that eruption of nationalism takes place, there's really no controlling it and no telling where it goes. Nationalism is a modern concept, really. It, it really begins with the American and the French Revolution. It's a fairly modern idea. People move from lo thinking locally to thinking in terms of a larger group. And so, next slide please, thank you. Think able-bodied assistant. Okay. We didn't go. Okay, that's too, that's, no, that's, that's, uh, Oh, wait, you yeah. to go. Yeah, I'll tell you what. The hell is so hard. <laughs> I went too far. There. Okay, somewhere in there. No, 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 no. 1918. 1918. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Uh, in 1918, now that's, that's the latest one. Here we are. Come on, go back, to, go back to that other one. I'm sorry, you were right. <laughs> hey, say that again. Say we that did again. this yesterday. Wait, I want you to say that again. Okay. <laughs> All right, you have witnesses. All right, in 19... 18, at the end of World War I, a really fun episode in life, which killed, you know, countless millions and then the flu afterwards, suddenly these states emerged. But they had emerged over the course of a hundred years slowly. The first states to emerge in this region were down here in the Balkans. Why were they the first ones to emerge? Because the Turks were the weakest. And in fact, the Turks had made a fundamental flaw in their empire is they never asked people to become Turks. They were just happy to get people paying taxes so they didn't force you if you were in Bulgaria or Serbia to think of yourself as being Turk. Eh, think of yourself as being Serb, just give me the taxes. But once nationalism comes around, and nationalism begins linguistically, all of them began with a sense of <coughs> the tongue. Because when you're, when you're thinking linguistically, then you're thinking in terms of your past, your language, your culture. And so over the course of about 70 years, this area here had become national states in various forms. And then after World War I, which destroyed all of those empires entirely, now you have this belt of states. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Sure it is. Mm, yes and no. Yes and no. Because when you think of a state, okay, you think of the United States, you think of Mexico, you think of Canada, you can think of identifiable borders, can't you? But in here, aha, borders are uncertain. Why? Because those peoples had all been subsumed, brought into various other empires. Well, at one time, there was a great Serbian empire controlled all of this. But at one time, there was a great Bulgarian empire that controlled all of this. See where they overlap? So when you form a new Bulgaria or a new Yugoslavia, which really, frankly, made no sense, because Yugoslavia was made up of lots of disparate peoples, well, where do the borders lie? 
Here's Romania. Here's Transylvania. Yes, and I've been to all the Dracula places. <laughs> and here's Hungary. Problem is, two-thirds of this area right here, ethnically Romanian. The other third, ethnically Hungarian. Romanians claimed it, dating to the 1600s. The Hungarians claimed it, dating since the 1600s. So who's really belong to Transylvania belong to? Is it Hungary? Is it Romania? And so you have instability in here. It's a term we call, here's a term I used yesterday. Ask your friends with this one. Irredentism. I-R-R-E-D-E-N-T-I-S-M. Irredentism. If I spelled that correctly, I feel like I'm spelling B. <laughs> Irredentism is the belief that that land really belongs to me. You see, at one time I really controlled these two roads here. My empire, you know, a thousand years ago. That was once mine. God gave me that land. Now you're sitting on it. I deserve it, you black shirts, you. Kind <laughs> of Nebraska. Fuck this area, we don't like Nebraska. Anyway, um, <laughs> we'll deal with that guy over there, alright? So, where does it all? So now you have instability in terms of you're dealing with your neighbors. Secondly, you know, when these empires all disappear, you know, it's all nice to have Czechoslovakia, but under the old Austro Hungarian Empire, the trading patterns were here. So now, where does the trade go? You used to buy products from. Those guys from Nebraska, and they're not selling it to you anymore. So your factories may dry up, your old trade patterns dry up, all your economies go right in the tubes. So even though you're independent, yay, wave the flag. Not really well off, are you necessarily? And then, let me point something out like really fast to help illustrate this. Remember in the map that we watched of World War II? We got Czechoslovakia here. Remember how Germany took like this part here first, and then they took the rest of it? The first part that the Nazis are going to take right here are German speaking. That means they are ethnically what? German. German. So was it easier or harder for Hitler to get them to come along? Easier. easier because they were ethnically German even though they were Czechoslovakian. And the reason why that, that little area of the Sudetenland, the German area, was part of Czechoslovakia because it was the most defensible boundary. And the new Czech state, and I, uh, I have seen the original map. I've been with the person who was the heir to the uh, Benish family who was part of the, the in 18, 1918. I've seen how they drew it. They just wanted to make sure it was that defensible. It didn't matter if there were Germans there. We had to defend the border. So now we've got all this instability. Then we have a oh, good grief, just to make life even more wonderful, the Great Depression. And the Great Depression in much of Europe made ours look like a picnic. That's pretty hard to imagine, isn't it? Remember the... Well, we you have bad economic times. Gee, don't guys come along and, you know, maybe have a silly mustache? Mm. And like to say, see, Kyle? Like Hitler? This is hurting. Hurting. Just follow me and I'm going to take away all your pain. Don't think about what I'm saying. Don't ever think about what I'm saying. Just use your emotions. Just use your hearts. Just believe. <laughs> <laughs> Hitler actually was the greatest salesman ever. Something I didn't talk about yesterday, but I'll tell you. He knew human psychology. He said people don't like to think. If you appeal to their emotions, their stomachs, your stomach is full and you're happy. What happens when you're hungry? What happens when you're hungry? You're cranky, don't you? <laughs> yeah, cranky. Come on, yeah. <laughs> You make the message simple. You don't appeal to people's brains. That takes work. To their emotions, to their stomachs, to their wallets if they've got money to have. And you make the message simple, and you repeat it over, 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 
over again. And they'll follow. They'll follow because people are like sheep. To just convince them of something, we don't think about it. And if we do, let's just shoot those people. <laughs> So now we have the Depression and all these right-wing groups grew up, mainly right-wing, but they were also communist groups, left-wing. And then we have World War II, just to make it even better. Ain't life fun in Eastern Europe? <laughs> and at the end of World War II, picture of Warsaw. Hey, that's what our cities look like. And that wasn't from aerial bombing, necessarily. Because, like, the Germans decided in 1944, when the Poles rose up to defend themselves, that they'd just pull in the tanks and blow the bejiminis out of each apartment, one story at a time. And the Russians were right across the river, just sitting there. And the Russians were going, go right ahead, Germans. Why? Because the Russians wanted to create their little group of friendly states across the border. And see, so if all the Polish freedom fighters die, they're not going to oppose the Russians, are they? Because they're already dead. <laughs> Having a cab driver in Warsaw take me around and go see right over there, my parents died. He hated the Russians who were sitting across the river more than the Germans that killed his parents. Because they could have saved my parents. But they didn't. Because the goal of Mr. Happy, Joseph Stalin, such a handsome goal, <laughs> was to create, last map, a belt of friendly states along the border. Now, to be somewhat fair, and it's really hard to be fair to Stout, who is a finalist in the Dancing with the Criminals contest as the worst guy of the 20th century. There are real contenders. There's Hitler, there's Stalin, there's Mao, there's Pol Pot. Really, really genuinely bad guys. Hitler just has the best press agent in being the worst. Okay? Soviet Union lost probably 35 to 40 million dead in World War II. They used to only admit to about 18 million. It's really at least unlikely. If you just lost 35 million people by somebody attacking you this way, wouldn't you like friendly states on the border so they don't do that again? Can you really blame them? Don't read me the wrong way. They're bad guys. But haven't, hasn't the United States been pathologically afraid of, oh my god, Cuba! Cuba's 90 miles away! And they're driving 1950-style automobiles! And the people don't have enough food to eat, but god, they're communists, and they're only 90 miles away from Key West, and Jimmy Buffett could be killed at any moment. And I'll never get margaritas again. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, we gotta defend ourselves! Do you think that if there were enemies in Canada, if Canada was against us, which is of course ludicrous because the Canadians are the nicest people on the planet. <laughs> well, you don't think America wouldn't be across the border in about eight seconds? Of course they would. So, they wanted friendly states across here. And so as the Soviet troops moved in, except in the case of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, Tito's picture. Yugoslavia had its own leader, Tito. T-I-T-O, who was a hero in that part of the region because he, and what was called his partisans, had fought the Germans heroically. And so he had real stature. And in Yugoslavia, he was going to be a leader. But, back to the map. Okay? Sorry we didn't put those in order. Um, but outside of that, the Russians decided to install 
friendly governments. Now you're going to talk more about Yalta next time, right? Yeah. Okay. Friendly governments. Now they had this expectation. See, there was this, always this, this belief in the Soviet Union that they were going to create, thanks to the ideology of Marxism, which was going to create this new wonderful cycle of history, which was all going to end in a communist world where everybody would get along, sing kumbaya, or however you're saying that in Russian. And we'd all, you know, be this new person. It was called Homo Sovieticus, Soviet man. Instead of Homo sapien, Homo Sovieticus, the new Soviet man of happy people, like the art form, socialist realism. See all the happy workers? This was the art form in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, which then became the art form in Eastern Europe after they became communists. See, oh, everybody's happy. The Communist Party would protect the workers and make life wonderful. The problem was, they were installing governments that had, you know, you, you can't plant a banana tree here in Loudoun County, can you? Well, you could plant it in the summer, but what's going to happen come wintertime? You got a dead tree, all right? The same way with governments, and, and frankly, a, pro a problem that all countries have when they try to intercede, like the United States would like democracy in country X. If the ground isn't fertile for it, you're planting a banana tree in a place where it won't grow. The soil has to be fertile for a plant to grow, and for communism, back to that. For communism to grow, you have to have the right soil. But there were no native communist parties before the war, except in Czechoslovakia, which was the only democracy in Eastern Europe before World War II. In Romania, for example, and I'll keep referring to Romania because that's actually where I live every year behind the Iron Curtain and do my research and all that, and that's the language I speak. But uh, maybe there you were know, maybe 500 members of the Communist Party before World War II. They're now going to run a country. What's the, what's the um, you know, somebody said yesterday, about 1,600 students here in the high school? About 1,600? Okay, so 500 of you guys, and, and you guys will lead it, okay? You're going to run the entire United States. So choose 500 of, of Loudoun County High School's uh, seniors class, or whatever, whatever students, and you're going to run the entire United States. Really going to do a great job, aren't you? Because you've got all the expertise in the world, and everybody's going to follow. No, people are going to go, who? What? Where? Where are these guys from? No. They tried to install it, but they could rig the system. Because thanks to the Soviet army, which was sitting there, they put communists into key positions. Military, police, economics. You know, you could have the, I'm not, I'm the secretary of housing. Yeah, well, I'm the secretary of the secret police. Rock, paper, scissors, I win because I can shoot you. What are you going to do? Build me a, you know, a condo? <laughs> I have a hammer. <laughs> I have an AK-47. I win. Okay? <laughs> and so they began to subvert the governments. They began to subvert everything. Institutions. What I mean by institution is, is the stuff that really governs your lives. It's the things around you, like culture, media, and organizations, and if you go to church, your church, those are all institutions. Okay? So they began to outlaw charities. We don't want private people helping other people. The party will help them. If not outlaw in church, make it real hard for you to go. Why? Because the secret police would take your name. And in some cases, the secret police arrested priests and executed them for being against the state, enemies of the state. They'd outlaw the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. I mean, if you think of dangerous organizations, really the Girl Scouts, you know, they may make you fat if 
eat too many cookies. <laughs> but short of that, I'm really not afraid of the Girl Scouts. <laughs> My God, honey, the Girl Scouts are here. Get me guns. <laughs> Keep a pit bull just in case. <laughs> so they began to subvert the organizations. They tried to appeal to young people. Why did the communists appeal to young people? Because young people are more idealistic. They're not set in their ways. Old people like us Vikings here, we're, uh, we're set in our ways. Have you ever tried? Have you ever convinced your grandma of anything? If your grandma thinks she has, you have two heads, are you ever going to change their view? Nope, you've got two heads for the rest of your life. <laughs> Grandma, I only got one head, see? Oh, what about the other one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can't do it. You can't do it. Old people get cranky. Get off my lawn. You know, I mean, it's just, so they try to appeal to the young people because you're going to create this new wonderful society. And let's face it, in 1945, look at that picture of Warsaw. Your world is devastated. You know, the last 30 years of it. You know, you survived. Really pretty rotten, and now along come these guys that are going to make things wonderful. There are lots of Americans that believe that. In the 1930s, during our depression, a lot of young people in high school and, and, and college joined communist parties thinking it was going to get better in some way different. They really did, okay? So they have tried to appeal to the young people. We're going to do this. We're going to go out and rebuild. We're going to do this and this and this. The problem was it didn't happen. The, the dream of this great communist wonderland that was going to develop didn't happen. Back to that, please. You want to explain who these people are? Oh, the, yeah. The, 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 when the Girl Scouts were out there, the Boy Scouts, these are the young pioneers. You replace it with the young pioneers. They had connections to what? What did it have connections to? It's not the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. We're building this new... Communist area, what do you think they their their key points are? Communism. It's going to be based around the party. Oh yeah. Everything you, is based around the party. Education changed. Independent thought, we don't want you to we don't want you to think independently. Because if you have independent ideas, you're not thinking the way you're supposed to think. So we make everything channeled. Do this math problems involve propaganda. I, I'm, not, I'm not making this up in, in, in elementary school. If the party plan says you will make 10,000 cars and you make 11,000 cars, what percentage of increase in the plan have you made? 10%. Yay, you're a genius. <laughs> but to see, it all was about the plan. What the leader said. Do this, think this. And you know, when you try to stifle people's thoughts, it's really not going to catch on with everybody. And in 1953, you saw the first revolt. Don't worry about that. It only occurred in East Germany. And there's no there's no wall yet. Okay? There's no wall yet. I know that. You hear the term Iron Curtain. It comes from a speech Winston Churchill gave in Fulton, Missouri in 1946. He said, an Iron Curtain has descended across Europe. And one quick problem there, Winston. Um, you got really good press, but you're kind of the guy that also helped create it, because Winston Churchill went to Stalin in 1943 during the war and said, you know, we want to keep uh, British influence in Greece after the war, so We'll keep 90% of influence in, the, in Greece, and you, Soviet Union, you can have 90% of influence in Bulgaria and Romania. So it wasn't kind of turning it over to Stalin anyway. He does. He gets good press. He does turn the current Iron Curtain. But we don't have a wall yet. That doesn't come until the 1960s, okay? So when we're talking about this period, there's no wall. But the gap between these guys in the red and these guys over here, already start to grow. And that, as early as 1953, people are going, wait a minute, they're doing pretty good over there. How come, you know, I'm standing in lines here. Can I make my analogy for the Go ahead. Think of it as a science experiment, okay? We are going to have two sets of plants, 
We're going to give one set of plant the freedom to grow and to have water and to have fertilizer and, and to mingle amongst themselves. And the other one, we're going to keep very controlled. We're going to give them only a certain amount of fertilizer, only a certain amount of water. We're going to control everything. Which one's going to flourish and which one's not? Yes. This one with the freedom is going to flourish. We've seen that. You all, you guys are science people. You know, when you do an experiment, usually one turns out good and one doesn't. This is human experimentation here. Okay? You've got the one side that's very, very controlled, and it doesn't do so well. And it was controlled. Remember that socialist realism. You were not, you were encouraged only to control, to draw between the lines. Color between the lines. No, no, you know, avant-garde stuff. No, no, no impressionists would come out of, out of Soviet art. You had to do that. The, the, the cultural ministers determined everything you thought, everything you read. You had censors. You had newspapers where you could not read the news. Because the news was all controlled. Any bad news here that happens here, we don't want you reading that. Bad news in our opponents? Most Russians and East Europeans in the 1950s and 60s thought Americans were starving to death. It was that controlled. It was that controlled. Of course, they're going to tell people. Because they're told things over and 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 over. And are they going to want to say, oh, the, the West, they're doing great. They're doing this, they're doing that. No, they're going to say, they're doing awful. The we're problem is a lot of people see it. In 1953, Stalin dies. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Okay? <laughs> and uh, now what do we do? You know, the really, really bad guy is dead. Maybe, maybe there's a chance for a little more liberality. In Hungary in 1956, people began to push for greater freedoms. Not end of communism. That wasn't going to happen. But more freedoms. But can you allow freedoms in a totalitarian state? You know, when you got a tomb, you seal it, right? If you seal that tomb, the body's preserved, correct? What happens if you let air in? What's going to happen to that body? It decays quickly, doesn't it? But you can't allow any liberal or liberality to come in. And so, 1956, Soviet troops move into Hungary in 1956 and crush the Hungarian Revolution. Crushed. People fought heroically, but you know what? When you've got a, 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 a bottle full of gasoline and, and a piece of cloth in it, and you light it and you throw it, I give you that, and I'll take a tank, and am I going to win or you? I'm going to win. 1956, key dates. All right, I'm giving you the key dates of the Cold War, 1945-47. I'm giving you the first two. 1945 to 1947, that's when Eastern Europe falls into communist governments. 1956, Hungarian Revolution, crushed. One of my best friends in graduate school, a young man, parents took him across the border, got escaped to deal with Okay, so now we put the lid back on until 1968, our third key day. In 1968, in Czechoslovakia, you had what was called Prague Spring. Prague is P-R-A-G-U-E. You got that thing about the trip? Prague is one of the capitals you go to. Prague is also my favorite city in Europe. My Prague is amazing because it was relatively undamaged in World War II. When you go to the, when you go to the old city in Warsaw, and you can't you go to the old city in Warsaw. Remember the picture of Warsaw before? The old city, old city in Warsaw was built in 1958. The old city of Warsaw is seven years younger than me. I don't consider myself old yet. I'm deluding myself, but that's another story. It's all right. Prague, beautiful, beautiful city. And in Prague, Czechs had this wonderful tradition of following intellectuals. In fact, when communism fell, their first president was a playwright. A playwright. You know, when you think of politicians, you think of, you know, former governor, former senator, 
I don't think the guy who wrote, you know, West Side Story or something like that, okay? He wrote Cats. Let's make him president. No, not Cats. <laughs> Um, well, the Soviets can't allow that in. That's intellectual freedom. Send the tanks in. Crush it. 1960. But you know what? Things haven't been so good. That's one of the reasons why in 61 and 62, <coughs> early 60s, the Soviets built the Berlin Wall, which was really, back to that, which was really a series of barbed wire fences, walls, they were keeping people from leaving. Why did they do that? Because between 1945 and 1961-62, one quarter, one quarter of the people who lived in East Germany said, I'm out of here. I'm going to the West. I'm running. And often that was the people who were the doctors, the engineers. Wow. How long can your society survive if a quarter of the population is heading across the border and it's the intellectual class in many respects? So let's put up the boundaries to protect us from those evil capitalists, those Americans, those British. No, it's not. It's to lock your people in, and that's what you are. You try to escape across that border, they shoot you. You can, go, you can Google search and see films of people just being pulled off the barbed wire, having been shot to death by their own people. You know, when they're shooting you to keep you in, things aren't really good, and things weren't good. Because economically, they weren't progressing. Yes, you had a job. You had a job. But it didn't pay you. And so your work ethic went right down the tubes. The old line in the old Soviet bloc was, you, pay, you pretend to pay me, and I will pretend to work. How long would a store in the United States last? Ah, yeah. Um, didn't communism say that the power relied with the people? I'm sorry? Didn't communism say that the power was with the people? Sure. But they're killing the people, yeah. and the people aren't happy. Yeah. Can't you see that? Yeah, and in fact, you're, you've already introduced the point I'm going to make in about two minutes. Thank you for the introduction. Good man. I like it. I didn't get that from Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> happened to me. Went into the store, 10 to 5. The clerk was standing like this. You're, you're me. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, and, and she's like this. And I said, excuse me. And she said, uh, moment, we'll go to the way. Just a minute. 10 minutes. She turned around and said, we're closed. She didn't want to work. Why? Because she had a salary whether she worked or not. So whatever I went in to buy, we're closed. I'm not helping you. I'm not helping you at all. How long would a store last? Stores, I'm not kidding, it varied by places. Hungary and Poland were better off than Romania and Bulgaria. It varied. Each country was different. But, you know, the store owner wants to get you into the store. So if they've got a window, they're going to put a, you know, a mattock in, a, you know, with some nice new style of clothing in. Yeah, stores would have, like, socks. But they hadn't changed in, like, 40 years. In the window. They had dirty socks, you know, but they're, they're, the food stores had with like stacks of sardines. Now, how, how much are you going to go into the local giant or food line or whatever going, you know, that stack of sardine cans reminds me I'm hungry. And if you won't share your pot toy. Anyways. Curtain with a suitcase full of jeans. 
I had somebody come up to me on the street and want to buy the jeans right now off my body. I thought, what am I supposed to do after I take my jeans off? It's going to be hard, kind of hard to hide from the police as I'm walking around in my underwear. And, uh, why don't you have any pants? Well, this guy over there offered me a hundred bucks for my pair of jeans. Had to sell them. Good deal. Very crummy jeans. No, you had all this, this stuff. They didn't care. They didn't care. Uh, you know, I. I I was online once in the food store, in the, in the vegetable store. I've stood on all the lines and I've done all that stuff that you saw in the old film clips. Uh, and uh, I was about sixth on the line. I was going to buy some onions. And the, the people in the, in, the, in the vegetable store, and you had to go individual stores. I mean, you didn't go like to a supermarket and get everything. You know, there was the meat store, there was the veg store. And that's why I don't drink uh, milk in my coffee, because if I wanted milk in my coffee, I would have had to have gotten online at 5 o'clock in the morning on the hope that they would deliver milk. It wasn't even a certainty. I don't need milk that bad. Not at 5 a.m. So I'm standing there, and in Romanian, I have this dead zone. I can't figure this out. You can explain the rules to me all the time. Romanian has like 43 different forms of the number two, depending on what the verb is, what the noun is, and Okay, so they, they loved me in stores because I'd always purposely go in and order two of something, and it was like a game. They were like, is he going to get it right? Yeah, he got it wrong again. So I'm sixth on line. I'm going to buy onions. The first five people bought onions. I get up to the front, and I'd say, I'd like two kilos of onions. She said, oh, you got it right this time, and don't buy the onions. They're all rotten. She sold them to the other five people, didn't she? Didn't matter if they were rotten. She sold them. A friend of mine uh, called, that, called us and said, I'm really sick, and uh, Miss Bird's mom, my, my wife, is in science, uh, and uh, so she ran down. We, we figured out pretty quickly why he was ill. Uh, he had eaten a, bo uh, a meal that included uh, bottled uh, spit, cream spinach. That, that alone should make you sick. But um, uh, it was, this was 1978. Its expiration date was 1965. You think that puppy would have been hauled off the shelves? Yeah. What the heck? Sell it. We don't care. We don't care. Because you don't matter. Now, for the party, oh, party had their own stores. And who was the party? The party was the Communist Party. But only high-ranking members of the party had their own stores. The average member of the party, and you would, Matt might join the party. Why would you join the party? Because get a better salary, chance to get ahead. Almost all teachers were members of the party. Well, I have to or, teach. The, I have to teach the. You know, I can't teach whatever I want. That's I have right. To teach and the and party. then you're a safe person to be teaching. So you join the party out of necessity. But if you're a high enough ranking member of the party, you had your own stores with an armed guard in front of it. If you went to those stores any day of the week, you could have gotten bananas. Bananas appeared for the general public twice the year I lived there. In 12, now you take bananas for granted, don't you? Two times they appeared, which was double what they had appeared the year before. And I happened to be strolling by when they wheeled them out. Bananas, oh my God. I bought 20 kilos of bananas. I don't know what came over me. For those of you that know what a kilogram is, that's 44 pounds of bananas. <laughs> One human being cannot eat 44 pounds of bananas without, you know, devolving into eight, you know, or something like that. All right? So I got on the bus and I was passing out bananas to people. You know, I probably still a god over there with the a guy at Google. Um, I'm now a comic book hero. Um, okay, lame comic book, but okay. Um, yeah, just, you got saw so line, you got on it. How disillusioning is this? How disillusioning is this? But it's always better over here. It's better. It's better. It's a movie. This was great. Because the secret police couldn't take down names because it's a dark and movie theater. There's a movie called Ratatouille. And uh, the story about this Romanian woman who gets a visa. You couldn't get visas. You couldn't leave. You couldn't even go to another communist country. Most people. Because they didn't even like each other. Romanians and Hungarians. Remember, they don't like each other. That's what they do. And so, 
the, uh, the premise of the movie, which was a really bad movie, was that this woman gets an exit visa, so she goes and lives in then West Germany, and boy, she's got a nice apartment, she's got a Mercedes Benz, she's got everything, but she misses the homeland, she misses Romania, so she decides to come back, leave it all behind, and come back. And the people in the movie theater are yelling at the screen, You're an idiot! Stay there! Don't come back! You have a Mercedes Benz for crying out loud! You're coming back to a country where you waited 10 years to get a car. And when you got the car, it often didn't work. Uh, Romanian Dachas, for example, had a propensity for the back seat to fill with gasoline from the gas tank. <laughs> Sort of a downer, okay? <laughs> so next time you buy a car, go, does this uh, fill my back seat with gas by any chance? I'd like one of those. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, you just, you know, people, people would see this sort of stuff. They'd see the other side. I, I really feel bad. I, I still mentally apologize to this guy, and it's been 35 years since this occurred, but I still feel badly about it. I was sitting in a movie theater. I had a really, really bad day. And uh, I don't love those bad days. And I'm sitting there and watching one of these walking tall movies. You know, guys don't remember, but it was this, this awful movies, series of movies about this southern sheriff who, you know, beats up gang members with a big stick. Okay? And Sheriff Pusser catches this guy, and he's got a Trans Am, and he's convinced, beautiful Trans Am. 1970s Trans Am, really classic car. And he's convinced that the drugs are in the car. So he takes his stick and he's breaking the windshield and he's busts the door off and he's beating the engine. This guy's sitting next to me. He's like, oh God, how could he do this? And he turns to me and says, you're an American, what's he doing? I said, well, this is what I thought. Ah, man, you know, when it comes time to change the oil, it's really too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so we just take big sticks and we beat the car. <laughs> and then we go buy a new one. And this man, face fell. I the tears started welling in his eyes. I tried to tell him it was a joke. I don't think he believed me. I think I think I contributed to some man's suicide. I really, <laughs> I really don't. I'm not making light of that. I mean, not, it's not. It's a kind of suicide, but I'm not making fun of that at all. But I mean, he did not it. But I crushed him. I crushed the guy. I feel really bad about it. But he's, he he sold his mother and his grandmother to have that car. The sheriff Pusser beat up the stick. Well, this is this is the kind of this is the kind of local economy. This is my this mother. This is my just far just better half. Hi. Hi. This is this, this is, is the like the economy that was there, and so people began to. Well, how long can an economy like that run if the other guys if the other guys really run at full speed and you're not? And you know, behind the curtain, it didn't it, they couldn't keep up. They couldn't keep up. In 1985, this, I'm not making this up, we taught for 30 years in a town in Missouri. Uh, that's the last one. Um, that in 1985, there were more PCs, more personal computers in my town of 10,000 than there was in the Soviet Union the entire Soviet Union. How are you going to keep up in technological age if Maryville, Missouri has more PCs? The big joke was Soviets always have been at peace in the Soviet Union. The Soviet government bragged that we are advanced over you. We have just invented the world's largest microchip. <laughs> Think about that. Okay? The world's largest microchip? No, 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 you can't keep up with that. You can't. And the wheels began to come off the car. And then, in answer to your beautiful lead in, sir, 1980, workers in Gdansk, that's G D A N S K, Gdansk, not the usual dip bomb, I realize, G D -E. G D A N S K, Gdansk, Poland. Workers in a shipyard, just the average people. You and you and you and you. <laughs> 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 
led by this guy, <laughs> formed a union. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't the Communist Party represent the people? Didn't the Communist Party represent the workers? But if they did, why would the workers form a union? Because the party didn't really represent them, did they? I was standing online for Cherry about two weeks before I left in a piazza because of non-fertilizers and stuff. The, the fresh vegetables were really good. I mean, you want to talk organic. These were good. So I'm standing online. Up comes a car with a Communist Party official. And he gets out of his chauffeur-driven car. He walks up to the front of the line. And I just had another one of those days. I stood on the line and I said, hey, comrade, I'm an American. We're all equal here in your wonderful socialist paradise, aren't we? How come you get to go to the front of the line? End of the line. Don't sell them any chairs. The people were all, oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't sell them any cherries. They didn't sell them any cherries. Got back in the chauffeured car, drove off, made some, I don't know what, obscene gestures in Romania look like, but I'm sure it was through the window. And now they all went, you can come to the front and have cherries. I said, no, I will wait online like everyone else. <laughs> oh, you're a god. You must be that banana guy. <laughs> <laughs> we pray about you. You're a hero. Well, you know, if the workers start forming unions independent in the workers' paradise, how long can things last? Oh, you can keep things under control for a long time because people were afraid. You'd be locked up for doing things wrong. In Romania, one out of four people, look, to, look right now to the person on your left or right. Okay? Look at them. Don't make faces at them. Look at them. Okay? One out of four of you were at least informers for the secret police. Uh, <laughs> I know how I'm picking. <laughs> no. Yeah, one out of four of you. So how likely were you to ever say anything? Your children, your children were encouraged to turn in your parents if they were going to say Whoa. <laughs> and then the child would be a hero. And get extra perks. There's a way to get back at mom and dad, huh? Have them just locked up. <laughs> hey, you get my car? <laughs> You're toast. You go to prison, prison pictures. Jilava, for example. Yeah, I don't think you can see where all that sun's coming in. But that's Jilava, where I saw a guy, uh, I met a guy who had been released after being in that prison for 21 years. What was his crime? He was in the same elementary school class as the ex-king. That's all. That was his crime. He had been too close to the king. So if the king is here, you get to be king because I picked on you. Okay? King of a bad country. <laughs> um, you get to go to jail because you're that close. Okay? Come on, God. Yeah. And you, you're safe. You're, you, you fled the country, so you're okay. But then, <laughs> well, now people begin to experience, you know, I'm going to change, I'm going to change this. By the mid-1980s, the economic collapse of the Soviet Union was very, was beginning to show, and it was worse in Eastern Europe. In Romania, where I live, thanks to the great, give me a Ceausescu's picture, the great dictator, Oh, Nikolai, yes. That is the same poster of him that adorned my apartment. I put it there on purpose. Why? Because the secret police that would come into my apartment to look occasionally, I occasionally put a bad tie on him, or I put an eye patch on him, or something, just to drive them crazy. Because the secret police, I do have police files in all those countries. I've been followed. Give you an example of the police following me. 1985, I was over there doing research. I stayed in a hotel, got there the first night. Tepid water, but I got out and dried myself. I don't know where they got this thing. But they had the world's biggest towel. It was the size of this room. I'm not kidding you. I thought if I slip in here and this thing falls on me, I will suffocate. I will never find my way out from under this towel. I will try to crawl to freedom. Okay, next day I come back from doing research. And I, I, I take another tepid water shower because there was no hot water. 
Uh, by the way, in 1985 in Romania, you were allowed 140 watt light bulb in your apartment. The houses were kept basically at 55 degrees. Uh, mm -hmm. Operations were being done by sunlight. Operations in hospitals. At hospitals. Yes. Hey, you want to bend the patient a little bit more in the stomach? <laughs> yeah, if you had uh, your appendix taken out, you were given a local anesthetic with a sheet in front of you, and then you walk back to your room. <laughs> no, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? I couldn't, even in my own derangement, I couldn't make this stuff up. Okay, hey, very good. <laughs> I like that, I like that. All right, so, you know, here's the press telling you how wonderfully is the press always told you, I wonder, the press didn't tell you the other stuff. They didn't tell you the bad stuff. That's why, if you saw something, you were the on-the-spot reporter. You know, they like to tell you, you know, oh, send us your news stories, you're the on-the-spot reporter. You were the on-the-spot reporter. And I can prove it in a second. Because if you saw something, your obligation was to tell other people that were safe, not secure. See, it's a good time. And remaining was the secret of But make sure that people knew it. I got up very early after we got there. Uh, I left something back in my apartment. So I went from the archive back. I arrived off the bus just as police were showing up. A cab driver had been murdered by two people who this clown had released because to celebrate a great anniversary in Romania, we freed the average criminals because communism had made everyone better. Just tell that to an axe murderer. You know, we're letting you go because we have Christmas. Okay. <laughs> you know? Okay, so I arrive off the bus, and the police are coming. The police are coming, and I get back on the bus, and everybody's like, oh, whatever. How many of you are taking a, a language class right now? Okay. In your language class, has any chapter, you know, chapter three, foods, chapter four, the weather, chapter five, the cab driver had his throat slit. <laughs> you don't learn that. I don't know what, how to say that in Romanian. So I got on and said the cab driver was killed. And I, I hesitated. I caught a shot like this. <laughs> we got it across, right? All that day, throughout the city, But who told the story first? <laughs> and everybody had to repeat it. You know, there's big one big question is how do you know when you read the Iliad and the Odyssey whether that's really Homer's words? No. We really do. You know why? Because they did a study in the Balkans, actually in Yugoslavia, in the 1930s, and they went village to village, where there were stories of, you know, like Robin Hood kind of stories. And people would tell the stories because it's an illiterate society. And the poet was supposed to tell the story. In every village, the stories were all told identically. Because your responsibility was to tell the story identically. So we're pretty sure that at least the bulk of what you read in the Iliad and the Odyssey has come down exact. Well. It did, didn't it? It did. That's how you got your news. Not from this guy. Because that, the news always talked about him. And not only this egomaniac was the dictator, every time his name was mentioned, they also said President of the Socialist Republic of Romania and Secretary General of the Communist Party of Romania. And then they go about another minute, and then they say, Nikolai Ceausescu, President of these... Did he forget what his title was? Did you forget what his title was? You were inundated with it. You were inundated with it. But you know what? <sighs> this isn't good anymore. It began to unravel. And when the Soviets couldn't afford to prop up the governments anymore, they began to say, look, boys, you're on your own. In 1989, last key date, in 1989, listen, this is my area of specialty. I'd like to tell you I understood it coming. I'd like to say I predicted it. I didn't see it. And you know what? I'm not alone. I was literally at the conference for Soviet and East European specialists as the Berlin Wall was falling in 1989. And we were all like, oh, we're 
Are you kidding me? Guys who had spent 30 years of their lives writing papers about how this was going to exist forever, this morning's news made all of their research completely invalid. Their life's work was destroyed on the morning news. Yeah, communism collapsed like that. Only in Romania was there a really violent revolution, and Mr. Happy there with his and his wife, his charming wife, I don't mean it, went executed. Most of it was bloodless. Most of it was bloodless. Oh, the secret, secret police tried to kill a few people, tried to stop them, but the people were in the streets and they were demanding a change. And since 1989, the war really has been by and large over. There's still tensions with Russia, but that swatch of states, independent. Now, not necessarily well off independent, because things were so bad for those 40 years. For example, your life expectancy, if you were male in, in, in most, many parts of that, 55, 53, because of the pollution. There are whole parts, back to that map if you would. Uh, thanks. Uh, whole parts of the southern part of Poland right here, where so many heavy metals were put into the ground, nothing will grow for, they estimate, about 100 years. And all the trees are dead. And right in here, in Romania, they made uh, tires, blackening for, for tires. Well, they just put the blackening out in the air through the smokestacks. You lived in that town, you were black. You were covered head to toe in the blackening agent. If you opened the window to your house, it blew in. You were covered in it. You could never get clean. Imagine that for your lifestyle. People turn to alcohol to escape. People smoke like chimneys. There was corruption. Corruption doesn't end overnight. When I lived there, uh, uh, somebody came up to me and asked me for two cartons of cigarettes. Cigarettes were a very valuable commodity. Now, I didn't like doing that because I felt like I was buying, you know, it just bothered me. But I said, I'll marry a friend. Cigarettes. I will give you only one kind of cigarette, not another kind. Just had to be calm. And I saw him about two weeks later. He came up and hugged me. I said, why? Why are you doing this? He said, uh, I got custody of my daughter. I gave the judge two cartons of cigarettes. My ex-wife gave him one. You want to talk a corrupt society? It corrupted throughout. I saw in 1980, 1990, right after the war came, war came down, I was... Uh, uh, invited over by a number of the local governments over there to try to work with them to establish public service. I mean, you know, if you go into the agency, do you really want that woman who didn't want to help you for 10, 10 minutes until the place closed? No, you want your form filled out. You want to get your driver's license. Well, he said, he said, come on, we're going to go to an auction because all this, a lot of the stuff, most of the stuff was owned by the state, by the government, by the party. He said, wait, you see the corruption here. He said all the old officials knew where all the money was. So when the wall came down, they knew where the money was. They stick, simply stuck it in their pockets. And now we're going to auction these two properties off. He said, watch it. It's going to take exactly five seconds. He said, there's going to be ten people who are going to walk in here. One of them has been paid to make the bid, and they'll leave. I said, that can't be true. So. So the old officials, because they had all the money, we know that from the recent downturn, don't we? A lot of pretty wealthy people knew where to hide their money, didn't they? Yeah. So the old officials knew where to put the money. They kept it. Uh, infrastructure. At the top, at the top of math and science, Czech students. But the Czech economy, doing okay. But it's taken 20 years. Why? Because the roads are too lame. Who wants to put a factory in to a place where you can't transport the goods very easily? It's called infrastructure. Okay? The American economy stops if you don't have transportation and communication, correct? You've heard that. that we, you know, we have a lot of bridges that are falling down. Well, if those bridges fall down, you're not moving goods and services, are you? So these economies took a long, long time Good idea, in case they were doing blackening agents out there. <laughs> <laughs> All the covered and sucked. Yeah. 
So it's taken a long time. Things have changed. Things have gotten better. Not always for some, because the older people, they used to get taken care of. Old age pensions, the health care was, was free. Not always great. Not always great. My friend broke his ankle. He hopped up to the orthopedic surgeon who was on the third floor of a building with no elevator. Got up to the top. They didn't have any plaster. Come back tomorrow. Next day he comes back. Okay, I need crutches. Why do you need crutches for? You're lucky. You don't have to go to work. Crutches didn't exist. Well, at least you had the access to the doctor. That's not necessarily the case anymore. So things are good. Sometimes for some people, not as good. But the change has been dramatic. But for 40 years, this place was locked in tomb. 1945 to 47, the communists take over. 1956, first revolt in Hungary. 19... 61, 62, the building of the Berlin Wall to lock people in. 1968, Prague, Spain. 1989, collapse of the wall. You guys have about 15 minutes. Ask away questions. I'm sorry if I went too long. Turn the light on. Questions, guys? Yeah, lots of stories. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you said that the Europeans were like three large states, right? Four, four large empires. And, um, they control they, that whole region. Yeah. yeah. And you, say, you said that they separated eventually because people want to be with their own ethnicity. Yeah, they, they, yeah, in large part that's true. Remember, these were all great states at one point. They are great Serbian and great Bulgarian. The Polish-Lithuanian Empire in the, in the 1600s was the largest empire in Europe. The largest state in Europe was, was in the 1500s and 1600s was the Polish-Lithuanian state. They all were dissipated. But yeah, you, you bring up that great that great heritage stuff, you know, when you're talking nationalism, you really, you know, it starts linguistically and you talk about your wonderful past, okay? You, you, you bring out the great heroes and you want to rekindle that greatness. And that's that's what happens. Yeah, is that ever going to happen like the U.S.? Because there's so many different um, There's always a danger. There's always a danger when there's multiple, and I, I'm, I'm honest about this one, guys, and, and Yugoslavia is the classic example. Because I didn't talk about Yugoslavia, but in the 90s, when Tito was dead, what happened in Yugoslavia? Bosnia, mass killings, genocide, Kosovo in the, in the late 90s with Milosevic, uh, the state, Yugoslavia just separated. Yes, that can never be discounted, but the thing that makes America different is people come here for a reason. They're not looking to leave. And that mitigates it. It's one of the reasons, dating back to Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt was against the idea of hyphenated Americans. In other words, German-American, Polish-American, white-American, you know, this kind of thing. He said, because what happens is that you emphasize the first word, I'm a German-American. Well, I, I'm technically a German-American. Great great grandparents came over here at some point, probably stowaways, or criminals. Um, but, you know, I speak German, but nobody else in my family does. But if I say I'm German American, what's the, what is the word that you center on? German. See, and that's what Teddy Roosevelt talked about. That's a difference, though, in America, because we celebrate it as kind of heritage, as heritage. But if that becomes, if you start to emphasize the first as opposed to the second, there's always a potential problem. I don't see it because people come into, they don't look to go outside. But it, it is a real problem in any multi-ethnic state, and Yugoslavia is the case study for it. And if you don't know what happened, the tragedies in Yugoslavia, take a look sometime, guys. You, you saw the worst atrocities since Hitler and Stalin it took place in Bosnia in the early 1990s, right after we'll the Olympics of all this in Saudi Arabia. We'll talk about that. Okay, other questions? Well, I'm, but I'm the banana guy. Okay, I have lots of other superheroes. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, okay. fur coat. Fur coat. Yeah. The fur coat? Oh, okay. That has nothing to do with this, but it's still a good story. Um, I was, uh, I led a group over, I did groups, tours, and we were in, uh, in, um, it's appropriate that uh, Sue is here. Um, it, it was, this was 85, same year I was in uh, with that towel. 
Um, and I took a group of students and we went to Greece and we went up into the mountains and there was this hunting village. And I'm not a big fan of fur and I'm not giving a, a, a value judgment on fur one way or the other. I don't want Peter coming down the year or something, okay? Um, and it was a very attractive coat and I just walked up to this guy that was, you know, in the shop and I said, how much is this? And he says, oh, in the United States, it's $2,000 to $5,000. I don't know, that's interesting. He says, but uh, um, I, I, I won't take traveler's checks. I said, well, that's okay. I'm not, oh, no, I won't take credit card. Uh, I said, oh, that's okay. I'm not buying it. So I, I started to wander away. He comes over. He says, no, but for you, $1,800. But no credit card. That's fine. Okay, $1,500. No credit card. I don't even know what little thing. Okay? I just was admiring the coat. It was a nice coat. And I'm not a fan of fur. It's the first time I've ever seen one. Okay, all right. For you, $1,200. No credit card. No. No, please. Oh, I'll bring somebody over. Is this your wife's size? I don't remember. I've been away for a month. Yes, okay. Put the coat. Yes, it's a lovely coat. Okay, $900. No credit card. Uh, I, I bought it for $160 on the credit card. <laughs> I had to get away from him. <laughs> I had no choice. He said I was the greatest bargainer ever. So if you ever have to bargain, bargain by just, God, I don't want it. They'll keep chasing you. They will keep, because now it's a game. They have to make you buy it. Their honor is at stake. Just believe it. Okay? That's, that's, that's the that's the story. Okay, let's talk a little bit. Um, so next class we are going to talk about what happens in the West in this time frame and you guys are going to compare the two. Like I said, it's like a science experiment. Which one is going to grow and which one is going to falter? And you see that the Eastern Bloc is really, really bad. If you look at today's example, look at North Korea and South Korea. Okay? You have North is still what? North Korea is still what? Communist. And they got themselves a pudgy little dictator. In, in some respect, I don't mean to interrupt, but a, a good word is also to include totalitarian. Yes, we talked about totalitarian. I got one more story to um, And oh no, I don't. and the South is capitalist, and they are very different. When you look at an aerial view of Korea, you can see where North Korea stops and South Korea starts, because North Korea has no trees. No trees. They've cut them down for firewood. They've eaten the roots. There's so much pollution. It's awful. And it's now been estimated that North Korean people are on average two inches shorter than South Korea because it's so bad. But do we know much about North Korea? Because, like you said, it was ins it's insulated. We don't have information coming out a little bit, but it has been walled off. Not a literal wall like they did with the Iron Curtain in places, okay? but it is so closed off and nothing's allowed to grow. Ideas aren't allowed to come in. We don't get any information in or out, they don't get anything in. You see that? I really want to stress that propaganda is so powerful. You know, you think, how are these people stupid enough to do this? How are, why aren't they just leaving? Let's just run away. Well, A, he said they'd shoot you. Fear. But this is life. Remember, everybody but Lizzie, life is hard to change. You know, Lizzie's fine with it, but everybody else, right? Yes? So you systematically Things have been taken away, things get worse and worse and worse, and then what are you going to do about it? There's nothing to do. Right? If I try to go over the wall, they will kill me. And they'll follow you. I didn't finish my towel story, did I? No, you didn't finish the towel story. I got to finish, the, I'm sorry, I got diverted. I didn't finish the towel story. Okay. Uh, they, so I took this shower. I'm sorry about that. I got to try to do my entire career in one hour. Okay? It's, it's, it's kind of hard. Uh, okay. So this towel. I think I'm going to die under it. I stood up the second night, and I, what have we all done this? You don't say you haven't done it. You're all by yourself. Something happens. You know, if you hit your toe, <laughs> you're saying something, right? And probably not something good. So I just said, 
You can fill in that blank with whatever you want. <laughs> I hate this town. What do you have to do around here to get a regular sized towel? I just done it. The next day, a regular sized towel showed up. What does that For mean? the remaining time. Yeah, but they were listening. I just pray they were only listening. I hope there wasn't a camera and some guy was hired to. Oh God, I gotta look at this. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't shower. They don't pay me enough. <laughs> I'm getting a different job. No. But the day I checked out, big tell came back the next day. That's the power of our space. And when you live under that system where they're watching you all the time, remember, close look. Look. And we know it's him. We know he's a member of the secret. That means that at least uh, eight more of you are too, but we don't know who they are. They're telling. They're telling. We had friends. We had friends. We thought who got a visit from the police. We saw them on the street a couple days later. They didn't even acknowledge that we existed. See the police in the Don't talk to us. Fear is a big motivator. People sometimes ask, why did people leave? How are you going to get out? You go to risk machine guns? You go to swim across the Danube? You understand you're going to go from one country into the next country, but the next country's communist too, and they're going to send you back. See, in North Korea, if you flee into China, China returns you to North Korea. What happens when you're taken back off the train into North Korea? You are taken off the train at the local prison, aren't you? They're not going to say, well, welcome back. Have a root beer. We're <laughs> bound. Shared, you shared your story to get out of Iran, right? Yeah. With us? You know, he, his dad had to bribe somebody to get you guys out of Iran? Well, okay. Because uh, it is closed off, just like what we're talking about, totalitarian state. You know, they're not free. Go ahead. Uh, my uncle, when he was 18, he tried to sneak in when the revolution was going on. He tried mm -hmm. to sneak in through the Turkish border, mm -hmm. and he was getting shot at, so he went to return. That's why they didn't leave. Um, all right, so you know let's, go back. Yeah. let's go back to um, <laughs> our themes here. What can we tie in? What can what what are themes? What can you bring in? Give me some ideas. Give me some You can look back on the, the sheet if you can't remember our themes. What about social structure? Let's go there. Social structure. What kind of social structure is there? Who's at the top? Anybody, anybody, rich people and specifically Zane? The dictator. The dictator, and underneath the dictator is anybody who belongs to the, the party. You are a party member and a high party I mean, just because Scott chooses to be a party member. Doesn't mean he gets to go to the party store. Party store and go get hats, yeah. Um, and, but if you are high enough in there, you are one of those bureaucratic party members. Got to get sparks for it, don't worry. Um, then you got to go to the party. Okay, so the social structure. Who's at the top? Let's say it again. Everybody with me? Party. And that's the smaller version, smaller part, right? Than everybody else. And we know what what is communism? Let's just let's just take that. What is communism? Equality. Equality. Okay. Now what is the Cold War? No. Oh my gosh, he's back. Alright. What um what's the Cold War? Well you're not leaving yet. Come on. What's the Cold War? The um Say it, Courtney. Young space. An arms race, okay. We will talk more about that next time. What else? What is the Cold War? What? And America. We're going to talk about there are only two true victors out of World War II. There's the U.S. and there's the Soviets. And when you are victorious, what do you get to do? Do a little dance and do whatever you want, right? And they are wanting to show each other that they're the strongest. And that's where the arms race comes in. But fundamentally, it's not just U.S. versus Soviets, it's what versus what? Communism. Communism versus capitalism. Which one will win? 
fundamentally how we structure everything, because our economics affects our government, it affects our social structure, it affects our way of life, everything by our economy. And for all intents and purposes, that is what we're based around. We've got dictator, liberal democracy, communism, capitalism, free state versus mm, definitely not free state. Everybody see that? All right, so tell me something about, all right, tell me something about state building. Tell me something about state building in the Eastern Bloc. Steel? I told them because of Stalin, this would be steel right here, <laughs> if his father had his way. Tell me something about the state building. What did they do when they were building the Eastern Bloc, the Iron Curtain? What did they do for us? Yes, they're going to put people who are part of what in the government? The party, especially those who are part of the Soviets. Okay. What else? What else did they do? Neha, what did they do to build their state? Build, build the communist bloc. What did they do? Okay, so they structured what everyone did. Okay, what else did they do? Think of the map, the actual state itself. What did they do? Okay, kill everyone who opposed them. Let's 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 think countries here, people. Countries. Hang on, what did they do? What did they create?